today's class is going to be a little bit different. Instead of going over some of the mechanics of operating system design, well, I guess in one sense we will be doing that, but this is going to be at a slightly higher level on this. Presumably, you've all at some level taken a look at the research paper that Jeff had asked about operating system design and hints thereof on this. Uh, this is, if you've looked at it already, it's a classic paper. It certainly has like lots of sites way back when. And as a result, it should give you a bunch of ideas as far as, number one, the fact that it is so old and it's still being cited. It probably means these are good ideas that have stood the test of time on this. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is I'm sure you've read through the examples. A lot of them are severely dated. The specific applications do not always apply to things that you're dealing with today. On the other hand, there are certain areas where the author speculates that this might be a good idea to do this, and you're thinking, good grief, I deal with this all the time. This is a huge problem. Well, that's because things have changed over the course of the ensuing three decades since this paper was published on this. But the point being is, you know how Jeff talks about like trends or policies or theories on this? Well, that's kind of what this paper is trying to get at. In other words, how can we design systems, and obviously, as far as you guys are concerned, operating systems? Like, what are some of the things that you need to kind of take to the bank that this particular general idea works, even though the specific applications or problems that they were dealing with back when may not be as important as they are today. But again, the general principles still very much remain on this. So as we're going through this today, uh, I'd also like to kind of draw some attention to some of the projects that you've been dealing with. I certainly, in reading this paper myself, got a few laughs more than once in terms of, yeah, I should have done that in terms of my own research or back when, when I was coding up OS 161 on this. So. This paper is different in a couple other ways, too, in the sense that it really isn't a research search paper, per se, by definition. The author even admits it's not a bunch of de novo factoids. Rather, the author is kind of just collecting the wisdom of the ages as of 30 years ago already. And the other thing, too, it's a single author paper on this. How many computer science papers, for that matter, even in STEM fields, are single author? It probably means it's a little bit unusual or off the track. And it probably, again, means it's a little bit classic on this. So before we actually begin dive into that, I should say, and I did jump over this a second. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Now. There we go. OK, and that is vicarious kudos from Jeff on this. You guys are really tearing up the barn in terms of assignment 3.2, 3.3, and whatnot. And really, it, it is, this is quite good. I think the class as a whole, you need to kind of pat yourselves on the back. Even if you haven't submitted complete or gotten complete grades for 3.2 or 3.3, rest assured, number one, you probably already got Jeff's email. You can continue to submit right through the end of the semester on that. So uh, that's one thing as far as how much to balance in terms of additional time to put into coding. Obviously, if you're already at 80% or above in terms of point value, it's kind of pointless, excuse the pun, to consider continue to bang on it right now, at least until you get your quizzes out of the way next week. But I would say, we, I've already talked with you, a bunch of you on this. I know I am as guilty as anyone else. Over the summer after I took operating systems with Jeff, yeah, I had been bitten, and I continued to toy around with OS 161 well into the summer on this. And I think more than a few of you uh, should be targeting some something like copy on write or who knows, multi-threaded processes. There's a whole bunch of stuff for you to kind of dig in on that too. But anyway, like I say, uh, again, Jeff really is quite pleased with how the class has done so far. Uh, one other remark from the trenches on this, obviously there is going to be the quiz coming up 168 hours from now. I think it's what, 3.30 or so? OK, so it'll be 169 hours from now. So I believe it's, it's Monday, right? I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? OK. And I believe it's same time plus one hour and same bat cave right here. So for better or for worse, this is where it is going to be scheduled on this. So you already know the drill about this. Uh, I would say the test is roughly speaking twice as long in the midterm, but you'll have three times the time. And that really should address the time crunch issue, which I think affected a bunch of people on the midterms. I know from proctoring and from taking the final in the past, I can tell you that the final does not have the time pressure that the midterm does. That said and done, it kind of distresses me sometimes to see a lot of people leaving earlier than they necessarily should because I, 
I'm thinking to myself, I bet that person could continue to pound away and get more points on this. So I'm not saying you have to stay the full three hours, but please resist the temptation to get out and start frolicking in the spring sun on this. You've got three hours in which to get points, and you might as well make use of that. I know you've already done the toughest, certainly in terms of clock hours that put in, in terms of your programming assignments. The other thing, it does go without saying, remember that that final is 30% of your grades, and you don't want to drop the ball on that. I've already seen one of Jeff's tests firsthand. You certainly have plenty of his released exams online. Take a look through that. Essentially, what you see is what you get. It's the midterm plus two additional essay questions on this. So, and I do mention that again because I think, I know Ali and I discussed this at length, I do think that the essay is where most people kind of came up short for the midterm. I would again guess that's probably because of time pressure, but you want to make sure that on the final, where essentially the essays are going to be, well, a good almost three quarters of your test, two thirds to three quarters, that you do want to spend your time thinking about the answers before you write them down on this. So uh, it's not difficult to score well on this test, but again, we are going to be looking for, are you thinking things through? It's, again, the essay questions. Uh, the, again, Jeff calls them like the medium question. There's going to be typically one medium question worth 20 points, which is the equivalent of the one essay that you had for the midterm, and there's going to be two 25-point questions, which are a hair longer than that. So just make sure that you budget enough time you will have the time on the final, unlike the midterm, so there won't be time pressure. But again, make sure that you do take advantage of that. And uh, away she goes on this. Certainly, uh, Ali and I are going to try tomorrow and Wednesday to start in on a little bit of the mechanics of the test review. And we're going to be seeing if we can't go through like an old practice test on that. Uh, Jeff is going to be having a whole smash bang up ask me anything. I believe it's either Wednesday or Friday of this week. And the other thing, I know I mentioned this for the midterm, but once again to reiterate it, uh, I, I know for those of you, and again for those of you out there in video land who ha are not here because again there's lots of orange seats, uh, again if you are thinking about, hey, I'm going to watch the videos whenever, now is a time to start doing that because again if you have 15 hours worth of videos, again you don't want to leave that to go to let's say Thursday or Friday, it's going to take a lot longer for you actually to go through this and retain it than you might think. So pardon the sermon, I will, I guess, descend from my pulpit at this point. And I guess just any like last minute questions or thoughts about like the end of assignment three, uh, like general questions about the test without going too far off the deep end before we dive into the paper. Yes. So for the final exam, the, the portion will be after what was asked in the midterms or from the start? The whole Oh, yes. The question is, what is the coverage of the final exam? Jeff's finals are comprehensive. So everything from the beginning right up to the end of the semester. Yes. Other questions? Okay. All righty. To the mid I'm sorry, to the midterm. Okay. To the paper on this. Okay, so what do people think of this? So knee-jerk reactions, gut reactions. Sounds of silence. Okay, one thumb up, and everyone else, it's the social hour at the Trappist. Nothing. Okay. Well, let's actually kind of talk through this again. In terms of, come on, ah, there we are. Okay. Three goals in terms of what is this, okay, Butler, Lamps, and guys, aim in terms of this paper. Again, it's to, if you will, furnish and consolidate general tips for designing systems on this. And uh, this is one thing, again, Jeff already talked about this in terms of like designing a system is very often difficult on this. You've already seen this firsthand with assignment three. Uh, so how can we actually kind of maybe give future coders a few, bit, a few hints, if you will, to make the process slightly less painful and perhaps avoid some common pitfalls on this. In terms of what's going on here, okay, there are goals of functionality, speed, and fault tolerance here. Well, that is, if you will, he's going to give you hints as to how you can achieve these three goals. And then there's going to be some other three things that he talks about in terms of how, like say, where these actually get applied on this. So remember just to review things, functionality, we're essentially talking about does the system do what we want it to? 
right? that it doesn't come up short, that it doesn't achieve some subset, what have you, on this. Speed, again, we're talking there, again, typically about wall clock time, but there could be other factors in play in terms of maybe like prioritization of speed so that we don't have, let's say, one thing gets done quickly, but a more important task gets left to starve on this. Uh, one other thing in terms of speed, it's, we talked about this already, but remember there's a little bit of a balance too between speed and other goals on this like economics, how can we achieve something but at what cost on this. And then fault tolerance, for those of you who have taken classes like databases or distributed systems, that's huge in there. Not that it's not huge in operating systems, but again, we want a system that is going to achieve what we want but also not fail miserably on this. So let's actually take a look at this. The next page here, and again, this is directly from the PDF. So if you do have a laptop or a phone or who knows, a crystal ball, kind of pull this up. And we're going to kind of walk through some of these things in order as we see them in the paper itself here. So what we're we talking about here in terms of hints for computer system design, go through functionality on this. Okay, uh, Lampson talks about functionality is, well, we're trying to get a system to do something on this. And in particular, one of the things that Lamson talks about is this interface thing. And why are we kind of making a big issue? You can see, take a look at all the comments in this middle section here about interface. Why are we focusing on that? I mean, why do we even need to do this as opposed to these general three goals of functionality, speed, and fault tolerance? What is so bleepity bleep important about an interface on this? Thoughts on this? You've all used interfaces. Like, what's the big interface you had to deal with on, in this course here? Sys161. Hmm? Sys161. Oh, well, Sys161, that's the, OK. You know what? That is an interface, OK? I never thought about that, OK? But you're right, because that is an interface at what level? We're trying to get the operating system working with the interface of its emulator on this. What's the interface that you had to code against? You had to configure the Sys161 interface, okay? But you had to code against another one. Assignment two. <laughs> <laughs> AKA syscalls, okay? So, so what's the whole point of these interfaces on here? You can think of it, again, the paper talks a little bit about it. It's a kind of almost a mini programming language. This is the breaking off point where the system you're designing has to work with the user. Right? In this case, you are designing your operating system, OS161, to work with the user, which in this case is a bunch of automated tests. But in the real world, it's probably going to be some cranky user who is going to import data that has not been sanitized or uncover some stupid corner case or what have you. Oh, and by the way, the user will also try to get your system to do something that maybe it's not designed to or what have you. So we need to think long and hard about this interface because it's going to expose the functionality that you want to implement or should implement. And also, almost as important, I've even picked up from the paper on this, hide functionality that your system doesn't do. And that you want to kind of childproof the thing so that the user can't break your system on this. So, and I don't just mean simply error checking. It could also be something as simple as just not allowing uh, the user to pass in certain types of requests at all. Right? Because again, remember, it's, you want, don't want to really do anything more than you absolutely have to on this. So interfaces, super important on this. <coughs> Now, in terms of what's going on after this here, take a look at, well, that's right. You know what? Let me actually just bring up the PDF. It's probably going to be a little bit simpler to, ah, there we are. So page, OK, and we are, ah, OK. You've already remember Jeff's post maybe about two months or so ago about KISS. Keep it simple, stupid, on this. And this is probably the biggest recurring theme throughout this entire paper on this. Why? What's the whole point with KISS in this? Are we concerned with osculatory indulgence or what? What are we trying to avoid with the KISS theory on this? If we're trying to keep things simple, we don't want complications, right? Okay. 
And how can we get complications? How can we, if you will, make things harder for ourselves? I am being asked to design, let's say, a database or an operating system that has to perform to these specifications, x, y, and z. Okay? And that's what I have to do in order to keep my job and to keep the counter a company from having its contract terminated. How can I make things worse for myself? By adding extra. By adding extra, okay? Because if I do that, well, yeah, I'm making more work for myself, but also what? I am making the whole system more complicated. I'm potentially introducing bugs. Right? And I'm potentially having the system trying to do something that it perhaps was not designed to do in the first place on this. So once again, is design one system or one subsystem to do one thing and only one thing really well on this. So that's actually down there. Do one thing at a time and make sure that you do it well. All right? If you do, let's say you try to do some things too much, that's when things get complicated and that's essentially when things go off the tracks on this. Now, a couple things about this, I should say, we're talking about systems and there's also subsystems on this. You've already designed several subsystems. You do, you, assignment three is a memory manager subsystem, like assignment two, roughly speaking, is a process managing subsystem on this. And your interface that you're presenting to the user should ideally allow you to access one and only one part of the system on this. So think about this. In terms of preventing, or presenting, let's say, the syscall interface to the user, I am not letting the user muck around with, let's say, the internals of my buffer cache or my scheduling algorithm or what have you on this. Why not? If I expose essentially the entire design of the kernel to the user, okay? Security, the, hmm? security. security is one thing, okay? And closely aligned to stability is what else? I've got this finely tuned grandfather clock, right? And it's kind of dependent on all the gears working together. And essentially what I've exposed to the user is a couple dials. Set the hour and set the minutes on this. I don't want the user monkeying around with, let's say, the weight of the weight or, let's say, changing the gears or something else like that because that's going to essentially throw off all my finely tuned handwork on this. So I want to expose one subsection to the user. In other words, what is the current time right now? And if there is a need for something else, like let's say it's a cuckoo clock, and I want to allow the user to have the ability to change, let's say, the species of bird that comes out and goes chirp, chirp. Well, that's going to be a different interface on this. So again, one interface to do one subsystem to do one thing at a time on this. Keep your interfaces as simple as possible on this. <clears throat> again, that's from your standpoint for your own sanity and also from the protection of the users on this. Now, a couple things, and I may have to scroll down on this. Oh, come on. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. OK. Now, that's a general rule. And this talk is going to have a lot of general rules followed by some qualified exceptions on here. So we want to keep our interfaces simple. And we want to keep, if you will, what they're interfacing to simple and quick and very efficient. But there's going to be some things. For example, things that are not used as often can be more complex. You know, it's the old 80-20 rule on this, that if I need to, let's say I need to set the clock to time, or let's say in terms of a syscall, um, I, let's say the read syscall does one thing. What? I read a file. Very simple, no more, no less. But you know what? A user that is sitting in a terminal is sometimes going to need to do very complex tasks. Like you might need to, let's say, who knows, script a backup policy or what have you. And that's actually what the author is getting at here in terms of, let's say, more complicated stuff like interpreting command lines. That is something where you can have, let's say, exposed more com complicated functionality that may not even be quite as efficient. Because do you really care if it takes five milliseconds or 10 milliseconds to respond to a user's input line. 
that's probably quick enough for that because the processing time beyond that is going to be a lot longer than that as opposed to something like the ability to respond to a read syscall that had better be lightning quick on that because there's a gazillion of those things going on every second I know that from my own woeful research and how it is completely overflowing the data collection server on this. So simple things that are done all the time, you need to keep very efficient. Okay? More complex things that are not as frequently accessed, that's where you can kind of let the complexity bubble up to the surface on this. One other thing that we're keeping in mind in terms of complexity, I already hinted at this, it, the user, the more we can not guess ourselves and let the user make the complicated choices of this. How does the user want the backup script to run? I don't care. Let the user make that decision on this. So I'm just going to give the user a bunch of very simple tools and let the user put together build the building blocks. So in this case, the user, presumably a sysadmin, can then use the syscalls with a bunch of typical Unix programs like rm-rf, that will definitely get rid of all buggy programs. And that, in turn, will allow you to, well, say, accomplish whatever it is that you need to accomplish. All right, so questions on this so far? We're talking about general principles. We're talking about just keep it simple on this. Uh, do a few things that are really important well, and let complex things well, be at corner cases on this. So far, so good? Straightforward already. Moving right along. Mm, I can. Ah, here we are. Oh, come on. Which page? Ah. Okay. Get it right. This goes without saying here, but you know what? You want, you don't want bugs. So, and by bugs, it certainly could be as obvious as like the old Pentium bug from what, 20 years or so ago. Well, that was in hardware. But it could also be something like a performance bug on this, too. And kind of distilling all of this down here, the author brings up the case of an old, I believe it's a word processing program from back in the Cretaceous era when I was young. And essentially, what it has is an O of n squared search algorithm if you need to search for, let's say, I think it's like a mail merge or something like this. So and the author is basically saying, guess what? Production and, uh, well, yeah, basically production code very often has bugs. Avoid them, please. So, all right. <coughs> Moving right along. Okay, we're talking about in terms of efficiency, keep things simple, keep bugs out of it. A few corollaries to this. Again, make it fast. So again, simple, fast functions. Again, try to hard to guess, like there's a few angles of what, what users might want. In other words, in designing a system, okay, I know that the user is going to need to read a file. So I'll keep it simple. What I'm not going to try to do is guess what the user might want to read the file for, or the specific circumstances, or the exact performance metric, or what additional features that the user might add. I know it was ages and ages before they even came out with an extension to the read syscall as simple as pread, which all that does is it adds on an extra parameter and it kind of combines lseq and read together on this. But it's kind of a generic, like a de design principle, like Linus in particular absolutely hates adding syscalls and adding features to this. And it's probably a good idea. We'll look at some other reasons for that later on. Right. And that is like, well, but this user might want to, let's say, do an atomic position and read at the same time. All right, but then you know what? Eventually, you're going to be serving these requests. Well, guess what? I want an atomic position, read, back scratch, and squeeze my carrot juice at the same time. And it, it, it grows, it's featureitis. This is the problem with this. So what we're trying to do is keep the simple stuff simple and fast on this. And in terms of, you know what, the user who does want a built-in back scratch subroutine to this great widget, you know what? Who's going to implement that? Windows. Well, yeah, Windows, that's featureitis. OK. But again, I don't want to do it, so who does that leave? User? Yeah. 
Let's punt the complexity to the user. Remember we were just talking about that in terms of let the admin use these simple tools to put together the complex backup script on this. Well, same thing here too. So the upshot is it's difficult to guess what users are going to need or what their specific wants are. So let them do the guessing and the configuring on this. We want to keep our stuff clean and lean and lightweight on this. Now, a couple other caveats in terms of don't hide power. What the author is trying to get at here, it's a very specific corner case, but you know what? If you have, let's say your company is contracted with the electrical engineers and you've got this really, really great hardware performance optimization. Like in this case, the author is talking about this one computer system has, I guess, the ability to do like a huge read of an entire cylinder's worth of disk data all at once on this you might as well expose something like that to the user because if it was specifically designed for that, why triple that particular functionality on it? So in other words, we're not going to try to completely cripple all functionality, but this is something that was imp implemented for us down below. It's not like we're trying to implement the additional functionality. Get the distinction on this? So if there is specific power of the system, we might as well expose that system, but we're not going to try to be cutesy and implement it ourselves. That's kind of the distinction that's going on here. <clears throat> Ready. Moving right along. If I can, ah, here we are. Use procedure arguments. A little bit, okay, uh, this is, I'm already beginning to get off the, my own track of familiarity here. But what is the author trying to say here is, you know, remember back to days of 115, 116, and what was it like MapReduce on this? Essentially what the author is trying to get at here is, rather than me trying to implement a system that does, let's say, 10 different variations, let's say I'm retrieving data and then implementing 10 functions, okay, back scratch, massage, uh, what have you, shampoo and what have you, uh, I'm going to instead say, you know what, I am going to, let's say, get my piece of data, let's say in this case, let's say a customer at a salon, and I am going to have a parameter that is, if you will, okay, a procedure argument. So in this case, let it kind of think of it as like a callback. Okay, let the user implement the specifics to this again. I'm just going to provide the basic tools and let the user take care of some of the more specifics. <clears throat> and then, oh, look at that. Leave it to the client. Once again, do we see a pattern here, people? So the more details that we can punt to the user, so much the better on this. And similarly on this too, we already talked about this Unix system. Encourages the building of small programs that take one or more character. Have we seen that? Okay, the real mark of a Unix wizard, you've seen some like Ken Smith scripts that are about like five pages long and they have like all these pipes and they have like, what is it, awk and sed and like all this gibberish. All right, well, the thing is that there are a lot of basic tools <coughs> and the administrator is using at the user level these tools to build something to do rather complicated. But we don't care about that. Again, this is a general design principle of Unix, and it certainly is something that we have seen bleed over into, yes, indeed, even the Windows world on this. They're certainly aping the idea of, let's say, more and more scripting on this. Questions, comments so far? All right. Continuity. I wish I had a clicker for this PDF, but we'll have to bear with us on this here. All right, constant tension between the desire to improve a design and the need for stability. Oh boy, ain't that the truth on this. Those of you who have taken 341, especially with Chris Schindler, do you remember him railing about what's the whole thing about x86 architecture? Why do we still have x86 architecture? Uh, in one of our DOS programs from 1989. Yes. but. You know what, we're also still running programs that have been written last year too in x86. Why is that? We all agree that x86 is a boneheaded design at this point, but we're still producing programs last year and this year in x86. Huh, how did that come about? We, we get the, the 1989 thing, but what? Yes.
Right. Now the thing, okay, I think you're definitely getting very warm there, okay? The Intel has a lot of clout and arguably a whole bunch of different areas on this. Uh, but I don't think they're probably holding a shotgun to people's backs, but maybe almost close to that though. What do users, companies still have that they don't want to move away from here? Yeah, because what? There was that DOS program in 1989, which means that when I bought my computer in 1991, I wanted to run that DOS program because I was still very interested in it. And by the way, now that I bought the computer in 1991, I might as well buy software that runs on that in 1993. Do we see, okay, it's kind of a rollover pattern. And finally, all of a sudden, we are here in 2017. So. <coughs> Part of it is we do get into this rut, and it's very difficult to get out of on this. But you know <coughs> Because of that, we do need to support. Again, Lance Torvalds is absolutely, if you want to see him go apoplectic, look, well, I guess a lot of things will set him off. Well, actually, many things will set him off. But one of the things that he will really, really tear a new one with the kernel developers for is if someone tries to be cute and breaks user space. That's the big thing on this. So it's absolutely important in Linux, Linux, whatever, that you do not break the expectations of user space programs on this. So that's what we mean by basic interface is stable here. And again, take a look at this. The interface is divided by programming languages or operating systems. Well, that's certainly one of the ones that you dealt with in OS 161. These can go on for years and years and years and decades on this. And even beyond that, though, let's say internally, let's say I can guarantee you at a company like uh, Microsoft, they have their own internal APIs on this. Well, you don't really want to break a project that has taken, let's say, gazillions of dollars for them to develop internally on this. So again, try to keep changes to a minimum on this. That said and done, sometimes, okay, if you look at the next bullet point here, keep a place to stand. And that is sometimes we do need to move away. Change can happen very glacially, but it does happen. We are now finally using 64-bit machines on this. And how does Windows deal with that legacy 32-bit code? Hmm? Cry and die? Hmm? It runs just fine using what? Yeah, do you remember like WOW64, I think it's called that, or no, whatever, Windows on Windows or something like that. Okay, so. You know, we don't want to break these things, but if we do change the interface, what we want to do is in some way try to maintain backwards compatibility on this. And there's a bunch of different ways on this. The author talks about, well, in the case of Windows on Windows or whatnot, providing, let's say, an additional layer of support to support deprecated commands for at least a while. As you can see, like Windows is no longer supporting 16-bit software. They've moved away from that. But we're still going to support 32-bit software for a while. Plus the other thing, too, another great example. This, when this paper was written in 1983, it was kind of almost a pipe dream, but it's here today. Remember Jeff's lectures on virtualization on this. Right? That is probably the biggest example of supporting deprecated systems on this. We're not going to try to support things at the application level, we're going to support the entire operating system. So if you've got that legacy piece of software, what we're going to do here is instead, if we're smart at, let's say, Windows, and, or let's say at Apple, and we're wanted, we want to kind of, because we know Windows has the dominant market share, we want to kind of make it easy for companies to use our Macintoshes on this. So we're going to make sure that our machines can virtualize Windows and thereby run that mission critical app so that if you come over to our side of the fence, it, you know you don't have to throw out your entire business model on this, it'll still work. So upshot is try to change the keep changes to a minimum, but when you do, always make sure that you give users an out. All right. By the way, this is I can smell this sort of a thing showing up in a Jeff essay type questions on this. So uh, what I'll ask you to do is possibly talk about what are some of the design principles in, let's say, software architecture, and like, well, how, well, how would you go about designing a system that does X, Y, Z? Or let's say uh, the president of the company has told you that she wants X, Y, Z features. 
is this a good idea or a bad idea according to general design principles? Does the president know what she's talking about? Explain why. Something like that. <clears throat> All right. Come on, come on, come on, come on. 2.4, 2.5. Where's 2.5? Ah, handling all the cases. Handle normal and worst cases on this. What we're talking about here is in a system. Now, this is kind of internal. Up until now, I've been yabbering on about how we interact with the user, if you will. Now we're talking about how can we make sure that our performance at least is, well, tolerable on this. Because you know what? Uh, in terms of we want a normal case, remember, the, think about the 80-20 rule. Maybe we should say like the 98-2 rule on this. We want the normal case to run very quickly, but we also need to be able to handle the odd case. Actually, probably a better way of putting it is this, is this worst case right here. What do we not want this worst case to do? Hmm? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. I'm going deep. Should not make progress. Not make progress. Definitely not make progress. And what else do we not want it to do vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the system? Okay. In other words, if we don't want the worst case to not make progress, we can extend that to also say we don't want it to bottle up and essentially make sure that all the normal cases also don't make progress on this. And Jeff used an example actually in the past about like the healthcare.gov website. Remember there was that debacle about was it maybe a few years back when essentially the entire official government website melted on this. And it turned out that there was one piece of software internal to the website that was a problem in certain cases. And the patch that they came up with kind of lickety split was, you know what, we're going to kind of do a quick test of what the user wants initially. And for, was it like the 90x percent places of, that is the general case, we're just going to bypass the one problem piece of software. And for the sub case, what we're going to do is say, you know what, thank you for your initial information. We're going to get back to you maybe in a day or two and ask for additional help. So that person is going to be told you're going to have to wait at least expectations were set. But the big thing is we're not holding up everyone. Because before everyone was being funneled through this really, really slow piece of software on this. So what we're trying to do, again, is separate these two cases of handling on this. How about an OS-161 example on this? For those of you who are finishing up with assignment 3.3, do you remember the TLB on this? And remember, there's kind of a bunch of different ways of handling the TLB. Namely, if you need to evict out a page, what's the easiest way to make sure that we never have to worry about, let's say, messing up the page cache, or I'm sorry, the translation cache of the victim process. Do what to the victim process? It's TLB. I'm sorry? Clear it. Yeah, nuke it. In other words, in every case, every time I evict a page, nuke all the TLBs on all the processors. That will work. I know for sure it will work, and it is very easy to implement. And what does that do to the if you will, performance of your system. Where's the Moab? OK, there we go. OK, it is right. So in other words, it works in process, but then what did you do? OK, you separated out the two. Because when do we need, when do we absolutely need to clear out that TLB? When's the, essentially the only case? When the victim process is doing what? Find breakfast. Well, yes and specifically running. So if I can determine, OK, it's going to be a longer and more complex code path to go down. If the victim process is running, I'm going to still have to do a TLB, if you will, flush out on this or something like that. But if the victim process is not, the vast majority of cases on this, I can keep much simpler. I don't even have to do anything with the victim TLB. Done. So again, try to separate out weirdo corner cases that are going to take a long time from other things here. <coughs> Speed. Take a look at this. Uh, da, 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 da. I can. There we go. Okay. 
And a little bit about this. This is kind of weird. Remember way back to there's two types of parallelism, if you will, temporal and spatial parallelism. The author is suggesting here, if at all possible, try to divide up resources such that kind of each program or each user has its own little sandbox and they're not stomping on each other's toes. It's kind of interesting because like 30 some odd years ago, memory, something like that, was much more precious than it is today. Memory is much less of an issue. Yes, we still have swapping. That was part of assignment three, but it's much less of an issue. In general, we want to give processes, give users, essentially all the RAM that they need on this. So that's kind of an example of spatially multiplexing things for speed because that way we don't have to constantly port data in for one process and then port it out before we, when we do a context switch. We're just going to leave, let's say if two processes are running in memory at the same time, leave the contents in memory, barring an eviction on this. With the exception, the author does certainly admit that there are some resources that are, well, a little bit more expensive, like CPUs on this. And in that case, what you need to do, the author is trying to say is, as a software engineer, design or decide whether or not a resource is expensive or not. In other words, memory is relatively cheap, so we can give each process as much memory as it wants, as opposed to a CPU, even today, even though there's, let's say, four or eight CPUs, we don't have 500 CPUs. We're not at the point where each process can have its own CPU. So that's something that is still going to have to be shared. Again, temporal multiplexing on this. OK. Oh, da, 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 da. Let's go down to Dunning. If I can find it, what page are we on? Oh, 14. <laughs> Dynamic translation. Something certainly was talked about back then, but everyone deals with dynamic translation directly or indirectly today. What do you mean by dynamic translation? Like what language in particular is notorious slash famous for uh, dynamic translation? It's the language I love to hate. Oh. Yeah, good old Java. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. And this is something, well, the JVM gets into it, and certainly Android was putting around for it for a little while. But again, what we can do if possible, well, this is what we do with compiling in, in the first place. We have, let's say, a human readable, easily accessible way of expressing stuff, and we have a very efficient way of expressing stuff, i.e. machine code on this. And we need to translate between the two on this. And certainly we can do static translation, i.e. compiling things, but sometimes we want to also look at dynamic translation. So this is something that the author is suggesting as a programming is running, can we kind of peek ahead to see what's going on? And Jeff probably mentioned that vis-a-vis -vis the context of virtualization. Did he talk about that? Like with full virtualization, you're having to translate bytecode on the fly. That was done for the sake of stability and security. But in this case, what the author is trying to get at is dynamic translation for the purposes of efficiency and performance on this. Because if you look at something like, again, the JVM with just-in-time compilation, or again, Android certainly doing that. In other words, we want to kind of think, okay, we know we've got this blob of code that we have to execute in the next five or 10 seconds. Can we look ahead and see what blocks of code are getting executed a lot? Aha, that looks like a loop that we are executing five million in time, I'm going to pre-compile that thing so that when I get to it again, it's going to execute a lot faster. So this is, again, another general trend, but one that has certainly become much, much more important in recent days on this. So just-in-time translation, an example of dynamic translation. Alrighty, Moving right along, if I can go down, page 50. Ah. Caching answers on this. And certainly, again, the classic example that the uh, author brings up is caching is in cache caching. Again, think back to 341. On a hardware level, what we're trying to do is what is the answer to byte 1000? In other words, let's read the value of byte 1000. And rather than fetching it from mainboard memory, let's save it in a much more easily accessible place. But 
from a standpoint of software designers, you're software designers, not hardware designers. This is a CS class, not an EE class. The same principle applies. Very often, you're going to be doing computation. And that computation is going to take a while. If you have to do it repeatedly, why not cache the results on this? And where are we doing lots of software caching these days? Examples? Where do we hear about software caching? Jeff talked about one in this class, the blank cache file system. Talk about buffer cache. You guys get into buffer cache this year? Oh, okay, okay. So you did talk about that. Okay. So in other words, this is one example of okay, what is the value of a particular file on this? Well, rather than reading it from disk, we're gonna this is the opposite of swapping. I'm going to read it into the buffer cache so that I don't have to re-get it again and again on this. Those of you who have taken networks, what's an example of caching that's now going on? What's all this net neutrality debate? Okay because of like videos and stuff like that. What's one way that you can, let's say, if people are constantly streaming or torrenting a particular video, and let's say the home server is in Tahiti, okay, the Black Sands of Tahiti. So what are we going to do as an ISP to try to make it go quicker? Yes? Prioritize it. Definitely that will improve it. And that's actually an angle that I even talked about in this too. So that will make sure that the user experience is better. How can we use a cache to solve this? I'm repeatedly seeing requests to this video server in Tahiti. Why should I continue to go to the video server in Tahiti? Instead, what should I do the next time I see a request for video XYZ in Tahiti? Yeah. OK, so let's store a cache locally, or at least regionally on this. So again, this is a big area of software engineering that is being implemented at the hardware level, the local system level, the cluster level, a whole bunch of different levels on this. All right, other things too. Come on. Ah, hints. What is a hint? Well, we know what a hint is, but like. Up until now, I've been talking about specific policies. You need to do X because it will produce Y on this. Uh, like one example for, let's say, we talked about, I'll give you an, kind of like this. In OS 161 is, remember, we're using the past to predict the future. We want to pick a good page to evict. So Jeff talked about clock and LRU on this. What is, let's say, a good page to evict? Do I know the best page to evict? No, I can only take kind of a guess at that. So this is a hint. I might actually sometimes pick wrong, and I might have to suffer the consequences on this. Or another one, I had some discussions with people here about how many locks should I have for, let's say, the core map. You can have one big lock for the core map, and that's probably what most people do on this. But wait a minute, Carl, can I optimize this and have a lock on each individual page on this? Well, yeah, it turns out you can. Right? And you can get rid of the big core map lock on this. And it will be a lot more granular on this. In other words, I want to, let's say, gain access to, let's say, entry 10 of the core map. So OK, what do I do? I grab a hold of that, and I want to see, is it free or not? OK, um, well, what happens in the interim, though? Let's say because I've scanned the core map without holding a lock, and I think, you know what? I want to grab this free page for my use. But in, while grabbing it, what happens is what? Someone else might have grabbed it, too. So I don't know. I might have made a bad guess. State might have changed on this. But that's OK. These are simply hints that we can use. In other words, I can say that this was the last previously free page on this. And I can start here. I might be wrong in my guess, but it will help me avoid the predicament of having to grab a global lock on the core map and iterate the entire thing from front to back each time on this. Now, the other one on the bottom here, if I can find it, is this page, oops, no, two ahead. Ah, compute in background. This is presented as almost a novel concept here. When possible, try to compute on this. You get the feeling that things have changed. 
Because today, let's face it, multi-threading goes on all the time. And this is something that certainly you know about this if your app is non-responsive because you're doing some stuff on the GUI thread, your users are going to be very, very unhappy on this. And as a matter of fact, this is something that is a big design principle of you know, any graphical operating system. You're going to have to make sure that the GUI thread is always as responsive as possible and make sure that you don't block responsiveness on this. So, just about done on this. So, just general thoughts, questions? Okay. Uh, the last part I will say very go quickly, it's essentially fault tolerance on this. And uh, he talks about like end-to-end -end principles. In other words, essentially what you want to make sure is that the end user get stuff that matters on this. If there's a problem in the interim, you really don't care about it on this. So again, in terms of what you're looking for is performance, is the system, if you will perform it within time and economic constraints, does it work, does it do what it wants? And lastly is, does the system actually not bomb out? So questions on this? Well, thanks, people. I appreciate it. Uh, Jeff to go a review and take it from there. <laughs>